groundwork, uh, and then we'll start talking about the metaphysics of morals today. We'll finish talking about that on Friday. Um, papers, comp papers are due on Monday, and I'll start with an introduction to Nietzsche. So we were asking, Kant was asking, what kind of defense of freedom we can give. Um, and this was necessary, you remember, in order to vindicate the applicability of the categorical imperative to us. And what Kant says is that um, we really cannot give a theoretical proof from the point of view of theoretical reason, um, that proof from the point of view of empirical science, of the existence of a free will. But it's something that we presuppose when we adopt, as it were, a practical attitude toward ourselves. That is, a deliberative stance as we consider what to do consider the reasons to do one thing or another. And so from that deliberative point of view, we presuppose our own freedom. And therefore, from a deliberative point of view, the idea of the categorical imperative does apply to us. And therefore, from a deliberative point of view, the categorical imperative applies to us. So we view ourselves in deliberation as constrained by the requirements of the categorical imperative. Okay. Um, now, Kant worries um, at pages 59 to 60 that there may be a kind of circular reasoning here. Um, so at the very bottom of the page, so this is at 450. Um, he says, there appears at this point, one must freely admit it, a kind of circle from which, as it seems, there's no escape. We take ourselves to be free in the order of deficient causes, that is, that we can uh, determine an end for ourselves, to cause an end for ourselves. So uh, we, think, we take ourselves to be free in that sense, in order to think, our, think ourselves under moral laws in the order of ends. And we afterwards think ourselves as subject to the laws, to those laws, because we have ascribed to ourselves freedom of the will. For freedom of the will, freedom and the will's own legislation are both autonomy and hence reciprocal concepts. But precisely because of the interdependency of these concepts, one of them cannot be used to explicate the other or to state its ground but at most only to reduce to a single concept for logical purposes, representations of just the same object that appeared to some. Um, so, um, so, autonomy and morality uh, are reciprocal concepts, but this, I mean, but, but Kant is worried that there might not be any independent grounds for breaking into these reciprocal concepts. Um, so the worry, you might think of this analogy, it, the worry might be something like this. Um, a person justifies her belief in God by referring to the Bible, which says that God exists. And we rely on the Bible, she relies on the Bible, because it's the word of God. So there's a kind of circularity, in, uh, in the, uh, a de dependence of these two concepts. Um, and once you sort of break into that system, they are mutually reinforcing. But that doesn't show that we should rely on both of those concepts themselves. OK, well, what Kant says is, um, um, just the next paragraph, at 60, right above 451, he says, um, there still, still remains for us one way out, namely to try 
whether when through freedom we, sh we think of ourselves as causes efficient a priori, we do not take up a standpoint that is different from when we represent ourselves according to our actions and effects that we see before our eyes. Um, so, Kant's, I mean, Kant's suggestion here is that we have, we view ourselves from two different standpoints. Um, so in the first case, we view ourselves from a practical point of view, a deliberative point of view, I've said, um, in deciding what, what to do, and therefore view ourselves from the standpoint of being able to um, determine what will happen based on our choice. And in the second case, we see our actions from a theoretical point of view um, as part of experience and therefore subject to the natural order of causation. So two different perspectives on which to view our, uh, our actions. Um, so one of the reasons I want to emphasize this um, last point here, uh, the, um, the very bottom of 61 on the 62, really is this idea of standpoints. Because some of Kant's language suggests, I mean, the words he uses, suggest that there are two different worlds. The world of things in themselves and the world of experience. And when there's talk about worlds, a, a, a dualism of worlds, the natural and obvious question is how are they related? Can they be related? What's the relationship between the two worlds? On the other hand, when we talk about two different perspectives, we're talking about two different perspectives on the same thing. Two different points of view or ways of viewing the same object. Uh, and the talk about perspectives then doesn't give rise to, uh, as readily maybe, to the worry about literally two different objects and how they're related. So look, listen carefully to what Tom says here, how he talks about this. Um, very bottom 61, he says, it has two standpoints, two different perspectives from which to consider itself. First, insofar it belongs to the world of sense under laws of nature, heteronomy. Second, as belonging to the intelligible world uh, under laws that independent of nature are not empirical but have their foundation here in the So, what I'm suggesting to you is that the world of sense and the intelligible world are not two distant, unrelated entities, but these are two different perspectives on the world, two different perspectives that we can take specifically on um, ourselves. As a rational being, Hence, as one that belongs to the intelligible world. That is, when we take a standpoint or a perspective on ourselves as rational, a human being can never think of the causality of his own will otherwise than under the idea of freedom. For independence from the determining causes of the world of sense, such as reason, must always ascribe to itself just in its freedom. Okay. Um, Okay, so the point is that um, for Kant, these two perspectives, these two points of view from which to view, um, especially ourselves, um, arise not simply from the need to vindicate morality. That would be the worry about circularity. Um, instead, Kant wants to say that the um, contrast between these two different perspectives 
um, is something that we can arrive at from a critique of theoretical reason also. So at the beginning of our discussion of Kant, I, I described very, very roughly um, how in the critique of pure reason we come to this distinction between things and themselves and, think, and, and the world of experience, how theoretical reason often tries to overstep its bounds and apply um, its, uh, its categories to objects that are not possible objects of experience, and it gets into contradictions and dialectics with itself. Um, well, so that's what gives rise to, from a theoretical point of view, this division between things in themselves and uh, objects as experience. Um, so we can't get rid of either of these two perspectives, either of these two worlds. Um, um, but the difficulty that we have comes from the maybe overzealous ambition of theoretical reason. Um, so, and this is again just a restatement um, about the deliberative point of view and the presupposition of our own freedom from that perspective. Um, over on 67, finally. Um, um, reason, he says, um, would overstep all its bounds if it undertook to explain how pure reason is practical, which would be one and the same task entirely as to explain how freedom is possible. Um, it's the very bottom of 67 at 450. Um, so what's left then, he says, is simply the negative task of showing that theoretical reason um, cannot go beyond the objects of possible experience, but that um, there's no contradiction in supposing that, uh, that objects as they are themselves can in fact be achieved. So that's, that's what we mean by a kind of negative defense. Um, it would overstep its bounds precisely because it would be trying to explain something that is not an object of possible experience, namely freedom, namely freedom. Okay, and, and really the last point that I want to make here is this. Okay, so um, what we can't get an explanation of, so explanation here means explanation in terms of theoretical reason. So perhaps uh, explanation in terms of maybe the causal relation between um, reason and uh, its objects. Um, and we can't get an explanation from the point of view of theoretical reason of that because it's not an object of possible experience, freedom, um, or will. Okay, so I guess what I want to just say here is that there's a kind of deep mystery that Kant is pointing to concerning the relationship between objects in themselves and their empirical manifestations. Uh, we can't get, he thinks, a theoretical explanation of how it is that objects in themselves give rise to their empirical presentations. Because theoretical reason is concerned with the empirical presentation, phenomenal, phenomenal 